I've entitled them this talk, or this lecture, if you will. Um, there be dragons indeed. And what I mean by this will become a little bit clearer as the lecture unfolds. So there's much talk about the unrest that is taking place in North Africa and the Middle East. Just the other day, I was sitting in a cafe and preparing this lecture, and an individual happened to notice some of the materials that I was reviewing and struck up a conversation with me about the unrest. Now, he was very flattering about the part that's been played by Egyptians, by Tunisians, and by the people across the region. It's flattering because in this case we see them fighting dictators, fighting for freedom. Most people across the world are flattering, and this makes sense. This is reasonable. This is as it should be. And it's as it should be because there is something mesmerizing. There's something captivating, there's something commendable, if you will, about the commitment to liberty and to justice and to the, all those high-sounding ideals that we hold dear. At a certain point, however, this individual, this person at the cafe, went from praising the Arab people to condemning the Russians and the Chinese for, as the slogan goes, and as he said, allowing dictators to murder their own people. So obviously he was referring to the resolution that was put forward before the Security Council and the Russian and Chinese votes against it. Now this is an interesting point to me. It's an interesting point because he was clearly supportive of foreign intervention. Assad is a monster, he said, and needs to be removed one way or another. Now his position is not an uncommon one. It's a position that we've heard reiterated several times over by a variety of heads of states across Europe. Media pundits, non-governmental organizations, and even members of the Syrian opposition have been saying just the same thing. If we go by the polls, it seems that Euro-Americans, Westerners, also support military intervention. This itself is also understandable. It's understandable because Westerners are witnessing the heroism that is taking place in Africa, across the Middle East. And this is something that they admire. This is something that they recognize and respect. And on some level, this is something that they would also like to be a part of, uh, to somehow find a way to integrate ourselves, to become a part of this heroism. Now the desire to be a part of this heroism is precipitating louder and louder calls for military intervention. There is not only a right, but there is in fact a duty to protect civilians. So well-intentioned, undoubtedly, I don't for a second doubt that the person I met at the cafe really, genuinely, does wish to help these people. At the same time, the call for intervention seems to be fueled more by a kind of desire to become involved than necessarily to help the people of these nations. Now there are a few people out there, at least people with a basic education and a minimal understanding of the events that have transpired in the last few years, that who would sincerely believe that the UK, that France, and that the US are particularly concerned with Syrian lives. The French we know are maneuvering alongside the Brits, who are maneuvering alongside the Saudis, who are maneuvering alongside the Qataris, part of, let's face it, what is a rather satirically labeled Friends of a Democratic Syria coalition, to intervene and overthrow Assad. It would be interesting to consider how many members of this coalition 
are actually democratic themselves. Well, at any rate, intervention is already happening. So we know that the Gulf states are providing the opposition with weapons. We know that Turkey is providing a safe haven to the opposition across their borders. And we know that Western special forces are supporting the opposition on the ground. Now these efforts are modeled off the Libyan intervention, an intervention that is regarded, is highly regarded by the West as a successful one. But I wonder whether or not we should pose questions about this success. For instance, how do we measure success? If we go in terms of human lives, prior to the intervention, prior to the intervention, the death toll in Syria, or sorry, the death toll in Libya was between 1,000 and 2,000 people. Post-intervention, by the end of it, that number was 10 times greater. Maybe we don't measure it in human lives, maybe we measure it in terms of the nation's future. And direct your attention to this photo. The infrastructure of the nation, and here we're referring to roads, water treatment plants, broadcasting networks, housing developments, and even hospitals, were obliterated. So maybe we look at it in terms of social cohesion. Ethnic cleansing in Libya is rampant at the moment, as black Libyans, as black foreign workers, are targeted and slaughtered like animals. In terms of rights, we have torture, we have detention without trial, we have execution without trial by the very same group that Britain, France, and many other European states regard as the legitimate government of Libya. In terms of democracy, in power now is a group, many of whose members are still unknown, and whose first order of business when they came to power was to revoke the prohibition against polygamy that had been instituted by the Gaddafi regime after the original revolution. So what is success in these terms? Well, success as it's been presented to us is that Gaddafi is dead. This seems a peculiar barometer. And what about Iraq? Another case of intervention. Look at Iraq. Iraq was the jewel of the Middle East. Prior to the first invasion, Iraq was the destination of choice for North Africans, for Middle Easterners, for Africans more generally. For those who were seeking quality education, for those who were seeking medical treatment, for those who wanted to learn about sanitation or industrial diversification, Iraq was the destination. Now the UN sanctions that were carried out in the 90s decimated everything that had been accomplished. And think about the impact of the sanctions in terms of human lives. We all remember Madeleine Albright, former head of state of the US. And what did Madeleine Albright say? How did she respond when she was questioned? I'm sure many of you have seen this clip. She was questioned on 60 Minutes about the toll, the human toll, the casualty, the high casualty rate that Iraq was suffering as a result of these UN sanctions. The casualty rate was so high that a number of heads of the UN Oil for Food program resigned because they couldn't bear to participate in something that was causing that much suffering. So the journalist asks Madeleine Albright, the toll seems to be somewhere around 500,000 children not just people, half a million children dying as a result of these sanctions. Do you think the price is worth it? And she paused, and she looked at it and said, yes, we believe the price is worth it. 500,000 dead children. The latest invasion, since 2003, completed the devastation, resulting in the fracturing of Iraq along sectarian lines. 
The success, we're measuring success here, the success, Saddam Hussein is dead. And again, there's that peculiar barometer. And what about Afghanistan? I mean, Karzai is referred to as the mayor of Kabul. Why is he the mayor of Kabul? Because he can't go beyond its borders. And he isn't even safe within Kabul. His movement, he's very threatened there, he's very vulnerable. As we saw by the assassination of his brother just a few short months ago. So the Brits and the Americans are running away from Afghanistan, achieved little more, jump-started the opium trade, and divvied up, fractured the country into a series, a litter of Bantustans that are run by thugs of the worst kind. Success? The Taliban is no more. In fact, that's not particularly true, because the Taliban is making a resurgence, which makes us question, was there any success at all? So it's important to consider that the desire to be part of the heroism of revolution, this desire on the part of Westerners, is precipitating calls for military intervention. Yet if we go by past experience, there is in fact no evidence that bombing a country in any way helps the people. But of course it doesn't. Does anyone for a second believe that by dropping bombs on people, you are somehow saving them. Well, we've heard this before. When all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. So to date, across the Middle East and North Africa, there have been two types of intervention. There's been malicious intervention, and there's been naive now, governments and media are of the malicious variety, and I'll come to them in a little bit. But for now, I'm looking at the public. And the public, however, is of the naive type. The public's behavior is slightly more forgivable because they mean well, but only slightly more forgivable because at some point, this naivete descends into a kind of willful blindness. So again, does anyone truly believe that Sarkozy, Sarkozy, and the French government are really concerned with the lives of Syrian people? The French killed nearly two million Algerians in trying to prevent them from acquiring their independence in the 50s and 60s. Throughout the second half of the 20th century, the French have fought proxy wars across the African continent prevent these nations from acquiring or from liberating themselves from European dependence. And just a short while ago, in December of 2010, when Ben Ali was on the ropes, the French offered to send troops to help him put down the insurrection. And what about the British and the Americans? Well, we've seen what they've done to Iraq. We've seen what they've done to Afghanistan. When Mubarak was in trouble, the Obama administration declared that he was doing his utmost to respond to the legitimate concerns of the Egyptian people. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton described him as family. And he was doing this. He was family by shooting the Egyptian people on the streets. And the Americans were not going to cut military aid to the army. So both the British and the Americans were supportive of Saudi Arabia when they sent troops into Bahrain to put down the protest there. And in 2008, Sarkozy, Sarkozy, thanked the Saudi regime for promoting what he described as a policy of civilization. So if democracy is of such importance to Western peoples, if democracy is of such importance to Western psyche, then why are so many Westerners 
or at least Western governments, opposed to the revolutionary, and some might even say democratic, efforts of third world peoples. Well, the people are naive. The people are willfully blind because all that I have described has really taken place in just the last few years. Though I should say, I should be a little more precise, so I should say that Euro-American people are naive. For collectively, third world peoples and third world governments consistently oppose these interventions. Because they know full well that these interventions have nothing to do with protecting civilians, but everything to do with protecting, or perhaps even promoting, the intervener's interests. So whether we refer to them as collateral damage, or whether they're used as a propaganda device, third world peoples are a little more than fodder when it comes to geopolitics. So if third world lives were of such importance, how do we explain the West's refusal to intervene in the Rwandan genocide? And why does the West continue to stand idly by while hundreds of thousands of Congolese die every year in a rather barbaric civil war? If third world lives are so very important, why does the West arm the very dictators that they later seek to overthrow? In the last 10 years, in the last decade, the top 10 arms exporters, the US, Russia, Germany, France, the UK, China, the Netherlands, Sweden, Italy, and Israel. So where does Assad get his weapons? Or the Egyptian army? Or Ben Ali? Or those so-called monarchies across the Gulf? Well, they get them from the West. There's no argument there. There's full recognition of this. But as far as weapons go, well, that's just business. And surely the West can't be faulted for not intervening everywhere. Some intervention is at least better than none. But again, that depends on which barometer we're in fact applying. What is this measure of success? Because if the aim is to kill more people, if the aim is to annihilate basic services, if the objective is to destroy social cohesion, then yes, military intervention is very successful. But if the aim, if the concern is the well-being of third world peoples, then intervention does not appear helpful at all. The failure of the UN, as I told our friend at this cafe, is not that it allows petty dictators to run roughshod on their peoples. The failure is that it does not prevent Western states from trampling over third world states or over international law. A declaration was made in Kuala Lumpur in 2003 by the Non-Aligned Movement, an organization of third world states. And they said, the governments of the Non-Aligned Movement reject the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, which has no basis either in the United Nations Charter or in international law. Third world knows all too well that humanitarian intervention only travels one way from north to south. I quote, Professor Jean Brigmont, who said, nobody expects Bangladesh to interfere in the internal affairs of the United States. Nobody is going to bomb the United States to force it to modify its immigration or monetary policies because of human consequence of such policies on other countries. So in the last year, repeated bombings, invasions by the US and the UK in Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Pakistan. Since 2006, attacks by Israel against Syria, against Lebanon, and against Palestine. The ongoing threats by the US and Israel 
against Iran, the policy of assassination, and the economic sanctions that have been leveled against it. None of these, none of these incidents have been dealt with by the international community. No one has called for third world peoples to be protected from American, British, or Israeli aggression. Doctrines of humanitarian intervention, the right to protect, which we've all heard so much about, seems to be a tool that is used to legitimate breaches of third world nation sovereignty. We have to understand that sovereignty doctrine isn't simply a legal fiction. Sovereignty doctrine is a form of protection that was created to ensure that weak states are not abused by stronger ones. You cannot violate their sovereignty, regardless as to what you happen to think. Third world states are presumptively opposed to humanitarian intervention because the last thing a former colony wants is a formal colonial power intervening, interfering in their affairs yet again. So such protection is necessary because of the naivete of your American people. And this naivete facilitates the maliciousness of your American states. The last week in the New York Times, there was a particular, particularly biased piece by Thomas Friedman. I'm sure many of you have read him before, Pulitzer Prize man. And he titled it, there be dragons. And who do you think he was referring to? Thomas Friedman says, we tend to believe that inside every autocracy is a democracy dying to get out, but that might not be true in the Middle East. <clears throat> he then goes on to describe the reactions that Afghans had to the burning of the Quran right, by a number of American soldiers. And this time speaking, Apparently, Friedman has an inner Muslim. So speaking, his inner Muslim, he said, Wait, this is wrong. Every week in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq, Muslim suicide bombers kill other Muslims, and there's barely a peep. Yet the accidental burning of holy books by Americans sparks outbursts and killings. What does our reaction say about us? Friedman's inner Muslim. Muslims need to have this conversation. Friedman tells us. Now I find it peculiar that Friedman fails to question what American soldiers are doing in Afghanistan in the first place. I also find it peculiar that he leaves out the fact that Muslims weren't killing Muslims in Iraq before the Americans arrived. And I also find it peculiar that he forgets to tell us that more Pakistanis have been killed by American drones than by suicide bombers. So yes, there be dragons indeed. Friedman concludes by declaring that he is ready to consider any ideas of how we in the West can help the forces of democracy and decency. How we in the West can help the forces of democracy this is the language of arrogance. This is the language of paternalism. This is the language of white man's burden. For the assumption is that the West is presumptively on the side of democracy and decency, despite the fact that history often proves otherwise. So a suggestion for Friedman. He's asking for suggestions, and I have a few. A suggestion for Friedman, a suggestion for my friend at the cafe, is that when we're dealing in arrogance, it's best to come with a little bit of humility. Professor Brigmont, again, at the dawn of the 20th century, most of the world was under European control. This is no longer the case. Eventually, the West will lose control of the Arab world, as it lost in East Asia, and is losing in Latin America. How the West will adapt to its decline is the crucial question of our time. Answering it is unlikely to be either easy or pleasant. 
So the center has moved. And my first suggestion was that we accept this. And I'll conclude with two other suggestions then. My second one is that we actually uphold international law. Racist policies, such as humanitarian intervention and the right to protect, are routinely used to justify running roughshod, disregarding the dignity and lives of third world peoples. If we begin from a position of humility, if we begin from a position of equality, if we begin from a position of equivalency, then talk of intervention becomes moot. The right to replace unjust governments belongs to the people of those states because the ultimate sovereign of any nation is its people. So by intervening, by interfering, we are in fact denying them their sovereignty. We are denying them their liberty. And in the process, we are subjecting them to a form of dictatorship in international affairs. And we become the thing, the very thing we despise. So my final suggestion, and I'll conclude on this. The West should surrender its hammer. If the West, if Euro-Americans really want to make a contribution to democracy, a contribution to decency, a contribution to improving the lives of third world peoples, disarmament is likely a more effective and surely a far less bloody strategy. Thank you. Thank you.